Welcome to the Emotions Coaching Summit 2024, brought to you by In Good Company, a global coaching training company and founder of the revolutionary Emotions Coaching Practitioner Training. If you're inspired today to continue your journey of emotions coaching, then be sure to check out our website at igcompany.co.uk for full details of that course. For now, we invite you to sit back and enjoy the amazing lineup that we have for you today from our expert speakers who are all leaders in their field. Enjoy. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our next session today, uh, where I'm introducing you to one of our very own team members. So Gwen Jones has joined us as our head of professional development, looking after the CPD arm of our business. And Gwen is going to be talking to you about the topic of exploring nuances that neurodivergence brings when coaching emotions. Gwen is um, a therapist. She is a qualified and accredited coach. Uh, she's also experienced as a corporate facilitator and her specialism is around her passion for allyship, neurodiversity, mental health and well-being um, in the workplace. Gwen's got an MSc in occupational psychology, a BSc in psychology, is level seven qualified in both relationship therapy and coaching and has more CPDs than she can count. So no surprise that she's in the role with us that she is in. And Gwen's passion is supporting people to exceed expectations and live authentic, fully realized lives. Over to you, Gwen. Thank you so much. And thank you y'all that are here to prioritize neurodiversity. Um, I will start by saying this is a neuroaffirmative space. So stim away, my stimmy friends. I know in a space like this, probably at least half of you are neurodivergent yourselves. So welcome to your world. It's a little kooky and a little fun by neurotypical standards, and that's okay. So cameras on, cameras off, uh, vocal stims, moving around, all that great stuff. Just this is a place where you get to live your authentic self. Um, the other thing I want to say is when we get to the Q&A, one of the problems I know a lot of people have is, I don't know how I'm supposed to say this. Now, there are places where we need to be very mindful about our language, right? Because we don't want to be offensive. We don't want to be ableist. We don't want to hurt somebody by on accident. This is a learning space. So phrase your question as best as you can so that I can get what you're trying to say. I will help you with the language and I will do so with an open heart and understanding your intent behind it. But do make sure you ask the question because when questions don't get asked, guess what? You don't get answers. And as a um, Carl Rogers says, what's personal is universal. So if you're wondering, someone else is wondering too, and one of y'all has to be brave, so it may as well be you, right? So with all that, let me do the techie bits and get my slide deck up and going. This is always the bit where it's awkward, and I'm like, eh, it's taking too long. Okay, so we're today it's all about exploring the nuances that neurodiversity brings when coaching emotions. And I love this topic so much for many different reasons. But one of the reasons is so many people are afraid to work with people who are neurodivergent. Um, I mean, to the point that it's like, oh, somebody needs to have career coaching, Gwen, and their career coaching is how to handle um, public speaking, but they're neurodivergent, so I can't work with them. And I'm like, oh, what? Like, yes, you can. It's okay. They don't bite, um, at least not you. They might bite themselves, but that's a stim and, you know, whatever. Um, but it's one of those things where when we start to peel back the layers a bit, understanding neurodiversity is really at the core of coaching because in order to work with someone's neurodivergence you have to work with the person in front of you you have to get away from those models you have to get away from this idea of i need to fit you in a box which really isn't beneficial for anybody um, but particularly in neurodivergence it just doesn't work so a little bit about me in case you can't tell <laughs> i'm neurodivergent too um, I am ADHD and also autistic. Um, I am here as the head of professional development at In Good Company, something I'm very proud to say. I'm only in week four, so uh, I know a little bit. I know a lot, but I don't know everything. Um, but if you have any questions about any of the professional development, if it's the emotions coaching practitioner training, if it's group and team coaching, if it's about wanting us to come into your workplace and do some training, let me know. Email me. I'm here for it. Um, I started my career with a bachelor's degree in psychology, as many neurodivergent people at uni do. 
Um, and I taught for nine years in the United States and in the United Kingdom. And I actually taught neurodivergent kids. Now, here's the funny thing. I was diagnosed my uh, junior year of university. So that's about, I was about 21 years old. And when I was diagnosed, my psychiatrist said to me, okay, Gwen, here's the thing. Um, don't tell anybody your ADHD. Cause you could, at the time you could only be one or the other. You couldn't be ADHD and autistic. All us ADHDs didn't exist yet. Um, but he's like, don't tell anybody your ADHD. You will not be hired. You will not be promoted. Um, they will find ways to discriminate against you. Don't do it. And y'all at the time, that was good advice because at the time we didn't have things like the Equalities Act of 2010, not to date myself too much, but back in 2001, um, ADHD were just the naughty boys who threw uh, chairs across the classroom, right? The girls can't be ADHD, which can let you know how high my, how high my needs were for support. The fact that I actually got the diagnosis, both as a woman and as, as an adult. Um, and when I went to apply for the job of teaching, I, my specific qualification was in special educational needs. And the students I worked with were considered, and I quote, emotionally disturbed, behavior disordered, and at risk for sociopathy. How you like looking at a folder of a seven-year-old with that label on top? It was terrible. And there is no way they would have hired me to work with those children knowing that I was neurodivergent. Because I mean, can't have a woman who's neurodivergent working with neurodivergent children. Imagine the damage she could do, right? But uh, I worked my way through it and worked in a system that was definitely not designed for my success. Education is not designed for neurodivergent success in general. Imagine working in it. So after about nine years of teaching, both in the United States and in the United Kingdom, I realized, you know what? I'm not so into reading and math, which is not great for a teacher, but I was fascinated by relationship. So how do we relate to ourselves? How do we relate to um, our partners? How do we relate to our family members, the greater community that we're a part of? How do we relate to society? And it makes a lot of sense because I'm always trying to figure out why don't I fit in? And I want to know how do people relate to each other? So I retrained as relationship therapist, psychotherapist, I'm PCC trained. Um, and through all those trainings, amongst others, um, I found this whole world of like workplace well-being and um, all these sort of sort of spaces kind of opened up to me that just didn't exist in education that I didn't know existed. Um, and so I trained again and got a master's degree in occupational psychology. And I love focusing on workplace well-being, um, neurodivergence, diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging. Those are all my spaces. Um, I am the mother of four neurodivergent children. I am the wife of an autistic husband. So we always like to go up to neurotypical people every now and again and go, what's that like being neurotypical? I mean, do you really just have one thought at a time? Do you really just do that? Or do your kids really just do what you say be just because you said it and you don't have to tell them why? Is that weird? Because those are the kind of conversations that we get asked all the time. What's it like being ADHD? I'm like, this, it's just my normal. Um, I'm also a lifelong activist and ally. I've got by hook or by crook, my allyship book is coming out at the end of the year, hopefully, um, because it is important to me that everybody is able to find a sense of belonging in this world. So moving forward today, we're gonna cover kind of the models that have been used to define neural diversity because they are changing. Um, the world I got diagnosed in and the world that exists today are very, very different. Still needs some improvement, but it's very different. Uh, I'm going to talk about the six principles of emotion coaching that are um, written and devised by Joe and Zoe and how they can relate to neurodiversity. And it was really tough figuring out what to cover when it comes to emotion. So I figured I'd just take some of the big ones that people might see um, and we're going to break it down for you to understand what is masking because it's a word that gets thrown around a lot. And some people think masking is, oh, I just can't be bothered. And it's like, oh, it's a little bit more than that. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about emotional regulation and how that might show up in the coaching room. I'm trying to keep this very coaching specific and different considerations that we need to take as um, coaches, as coaches. And I'm very lucky today that I get to give this big surprise reveal for In Good Company. So if you're here, uh, you're the first to get official confirmation, but that is all to come. So different definitions of neurodiversity. If you Google define neurodiversity, even in the AI, they're gonna give you about 12 of them. 
So let's talk about the um, kind of heredity, um, the inherited definitions that we have as neurodiverse individuals and how we come to find that we're neurodivergent. Well, first we have the medical model and this is how many of us um, define ourselves as neurodivergent or how we, we uncover the fact that we're neurodivergent. So in this, neurodiversity is defined as a series of disorders, it's deficits, it's, it's sometimes diseases, um, and they exist in a disabled person. And treatment focuses on curing them, on normalizing um, the able-bodied person and normalizing this idea that disabled people need to somehow make themselves more abled. And if we can just make all these you know, weird and wonderful uh, neurodivergent people look more neurotypical, then they're gonna be happier and life is gonna be better for them. And y'all, even some of the interventions I used early on with my students before I realized I could break the mold, they were very much designed as, this is how the world needs to perceive you. This is how you need to behave to be a part of this world because unless you behave this way, you are not a part of this. So it's very much my brain was born diseased. So what, is, what are we saying? Well, you have a problem with executive functioning, which is basically like, how do we human? How do we do the things that we do in this neurotypical world? Um, and when you think about executive functioning, um, it's, you know, if we take something like organization, right? Neurotypical actually exists in the middle of a spectrum. So there are some people that are highly organized. So my oldest son is autistic and ADHD, but he's very autism forward. He is highly organized. I mean, he organized his Lego by color and by size when he was three, like that kind of organized, right? Then you've got someone like me. My husband calls me the walking tornado sometimes because I am just organized chaos. I know where most of my stuff is, except for the things I need right now. Um, I don't have a problem living in clutter until it bothers me. Um, but being able to organize at the standard of a neurotypical person is a learned skill for me and something I have to put a lot of effort into. So this is something that's wrong with me because I don't organize the way everyone else does. Uh, you have problems with social situations, right? So as a neurodivergent person, I stick my foot in my mouth. I, you know, or maybe my son didn't say the right thing when he received a gift, or I don't know when to stop talking, or I don't know the right question to ask, or I don't social the way other people social, or I take things too far or not far enough. The barometer is, is just not, you know, it just isn't working. So there's a problem with that. You have a problem with performing at school and at work. So neurodivergent people on here, uh, I won't make you raise your hand because I, I can't see it anyway. But also, I don't know how many of you have your cameras on, but I, but I wouldn't be surprised if every single one of you didn't hear the words not meeting their potential when you were in school at one point or another. Not meeting her potential. Those were the weapon words of my existence. It was awful because I had problems performing at work and at school. Well, of course I did, because the metric by which we measure success in school is very neurotypical and there is no space. There is no room for you to be different, for you to think different, for you to read different, for you to consume different, for you to be interested different. There's no space for that in school, even with, I mean, this is coming from Asenko, right? Even with all the interventions that we have, you are still seen as a problem from a budget point of view, from a teaching point of view, from an accommodating point of view. We're going to do what we can to make this problem not so big. And then there's the problem with communicating thoughts, feelings, and emotions. So me, I'm an oversharer. Um, I had to learn, um, you know, what you share and what you don't share, both in friendships, in intimate relationships, in family life, in, you know, when is a story appropriate to tell in a classroom and not appropriate to tell in a classroom? I still don't know that one sometimes. Um, other pe people have a problem identifying those emotions or, or, or putting words to it. So even being able to, to try and tell you what I'm feeling, I might be able to kind of do a movement to show you what I'm feeling, but to tell you, it's just not in my wheelhouse. And that's a problem. And I always love that one because I'm like, who is this a problem for exactly? Because it's not a problem for me that you don't necess necessarily, but sometimes it's assumed to be a huge problem because it's something that's valued in our world. So what does this create? Well, we've got social stigma, right? Oh, he's autistic, so he doesn't have feelings. Have you heard that one before? I have. I've heard that one a lot about my kids. Either that or, oh, but he can't be autistic because he has feelings. It's like, Wow. Okay. That's, that's an idea. 
all this so all this social stigma, this rhetoric exists, you know, Gwen talks too fast. And y'all, I know I'm a fast talker. I do try to slow it down, but when I get excited, I can't. Um, so, you know, she's a motor mouth. It's like, oh, maybe what I have to say is important sometimes. It creates a sense of wrongness in us. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, but it is constantly this idea of going around. The question that I would ask myself all the time is why is this so hard for me? Why is it so easy for everybody else to fill in the blank for the thing? And why is this so hard for me? And it means that you don't trust yourself. So even down to the point of knowing whether or not my clothes look nice on me, I don't trust myself for that. I get, I mean, and and not like I'm trying to get compliments, but I'm like, does this go to get, am I allowed to put the, these patterns together? This, you know, busy clothes make me feel uncomfortable, but should I wear busy clothes or should I not wear busy clothes? I can color block that when I get, you start completely downing every decision that you make other than the ones of like, okay, I know I'm good at this. So I know I can do this thing. But all this other stuff, man, I need a lot of reassurance. It creates a lot of confusion as well, because you might think that you're being funny and you've hurt someone's feelings and you don't understand why they don't get your humor. Or it could be the other way around where somebody makes just an offhanded comment and it's cut you to the quick and you don't understand how they don't know how much they hurt you. And it creates a strong sense of identity dysphoria. I had a client say to me one time that they knew they were, and we'll talk about masking in a minute, but they knew how hard they masked and how much of an identity dysphoria they had when they were sat on the toilet and they got some toilet paper and they said, now, is this the normal amount of toilet paper that people are supposed to use? Literally could not wipe her butt without wondering if it was the right way to do it. That's the level, y'all. So let's think about the six um, uh, core principles of emotions coaching and think about how this applies to people who grew up with this medical model. Because y'all getting a diagnosis is all about what's wrong with you. And it's hard as a person. But when you're a parent, man, it's like going into meeting after meeting telling you what's wrong with my kid. And my husband came out one time and I just looked at him after these meetings where we, and I'm just, you know what, I'd love a meeting where I don't have to sit here and shit talk my kid with people. I love a meeting where we can sit down and talk about how amazing it is that he has such a strong passion for science rather than talk about how he doesn't like poetry. And when we do poetry, it causes him so much anxiety, he has to leave the room. But it's the medical model. It's how we look at kids. So emotions are neither good nor bad, right? I love this. I live by this. I always say emotions are feedback. I say it in my therapy practice. I say it in my coaching practice. They're just feedback of the moment. They're the weather. They're not the climate, right? Well, if I grow up with a medical model telling me that there's something wrong with me, then how do I know to trust my, how do I know if I'm supposed to be happy about this? If I can get so incredibly happy about finding the right rock on the beach and everybody looks at me like I'm a weirdo, how can I trust being happy? You are not your emotions is another one. And I love this one too, because you're not, because your emotions are liars, first of all. They lie to us all the time. They love to try and pretend like they're facts and they're not. But I'm constantly being judged by my emotional outburst, my emotional regulation, uh, my emotional demonstration. So if I'm being judged by this, but it's not me, then how can it be? How can you be judging me against something that's not me? And it's confusing. Emotions are unmet needs. Y'all have so many unmet needs, had so many unmet needs. I'm a very unmasked person at this point. But even being able to know what my needs are took work. So when you have these newly diagnosed um, people come into your coaching practice and we say, well, what do you need support from me? A lot of the time they go, oh, because I don't even know what need is being unmet, much less how you can fix it. Like, I have no idea. And that's a lot of the work sometimes is trying to figure out, okay, where can we alleviate some pressure from your life? Uh, emotions are not always authentic. And this one is the one that first time I saw it when I took the emotions coaching pra practitioner training, it almost made me cry because my emotional responses are so fake sometimes. Um, especially when I was younger, because I'm trying to respond the way I think everybody else does. And for me to even be able to identify what was an authentic emotional response for me took years of therapy. It was so true to me because I'm not allowed to be authentic. 
I'm not supposed, I get really excited. It's my, one of my favorite emotions is excitement. And the other one is wonder, which is also a value of mine where I get to almost like a childlike wonder. I'm not supposed to have that as a grown up. Uh, emotions are interlinked. Yeah, <laughs> right. They're so interlinked. But how am I supposed to pick these apart when I don't even know which ones are mine and which ones are somebody else's and which ones I'm pretending? Um, and the idea that I can choose my emotions, y'all, I know that. But the fact that I can choose my emotions authentically, that's the one that's like, so it's not I can choose how to demonstrate my emotions for you so that you don't get uncomfortable being in the same room as me. It's that I get to choose what emotion I'm experiencing, which one I want to focus on. Mind-blowing. Social model is the way we want to think about things. And I'm going to um, speed through this a little bit. Um, but this is about the person at the center is fine. They are, there is nothing wrong with them. And because they grew up in a world that is not designed for their success, there are barriers to them being successful in the workplace, in the school place. But those barriers are barriers of access and not an innate wrongness in the person. So there's a barrier for me to engage with others socially because I'm incredibly excitable. Just like for my son, who again, a, he's an Audi hd -er, but he is very flat in his affect. Um, other people think that he doesn't care. He cares very, very deeply. He just doesn't demonstrate it for you because he was raised in a mask-free zone. There is a barrier to me demonstrating my executive functioning. What if I'm okay with my organized chaos? Y'all, if you could see my floor drobe over there, you'd be shocked. But y'all, it doesn't bother me. So why does that, why does, is the fact that I have a floor drobe mean that I'm not organized? It just means I organize in a way that you don't like. So being able to demonstrate that when I'm a part of a team, when I'm working to a deadline, when I have a contribution, the barrier is making it so that so that I can do it in a way that I can be a part of that space. The barrier in demonstrating the mastery of work and school topics. Let's think about our dyslexic learners here, right? Y'all, my kids are going through GCSEs and A-levels right now, so our house is very, very stressful. Um, but I just sit there and I'm like, how much of this is really about whether or not they know science? And how much of this is about whether or not they can read and write? Reading and writing are so important for success in school. But when I'm out in the big wide world, I can be successful and not be the best reader in the world, right? I can be successful and have assistive technology help me with my spelling. I can be successful and never have to read another book again and, and certainly no more poetry. That was our big thing to get through GCSEs in English. Kate, if we can just get through this, you never have to read another poem again in your life, right? Why is me, why is that a measure of my success? And there's a barrier in being able to communicate thoughts, feelings, and emotions, not because I don't have them, but because maybe I experience them differently, or maybe I'm afraid that you're going to react in a certain way, or maybe I just can't figure out what you're feeling by the way that you demonstrate things because it's strange to me. So being neurodivergent affirmative means that all neurodivergent people, no matter how high their support needs are or how they communicate, have an equal voice and agency in relation to their own lives and communities. Now, the question I always get here is, but Gwen, what about the people who are nonverbal and in wheelchairs and intellectually disabled? They are still valuable people. And as much as they can have a voice in relation to their agency, we respect that life experience the same way we would any other one. Neurodiversity is a normal part of the human condition that is valuable, especially when appropriately supported. Any sort of um, evolution that we've had in technology that brought us forward significantly usually came from a neurodivergent individual. Let's look at Steve Jobs. Let's look at Leonardo da Vinci. All of these people were the red fish in a sea of yellow fish and said, actually, I can do this better. I can do this differently. Or why are we doing this? So a neurodivergent affirmative practice supports a positive identity. And a lot of the work that you have with your ND clients is getting rid of that internalized shame that they have around being different. So what does this create? Well, a sense of social belonging. The day I realized that my son only wants four friends was the, one of the best days of my life. See, I want like a thousand friends. I want a huge tribe. I care if people like me. 
And I was devastated that he wasn't invited to more birthday parties. He wasn't going to play dates. He wasn't, you know, he just wasn't really into it. And, and it just tore me up inside. And I remember this day came where I was, where, you know, oh, you know, so-and-so's going to so-and-so's birthday party. It's like, oh. And I'm like, oh, he's telling me this because he wants to check in. I was like, oh, do you wish you were going to that birthday party? He's like, no, why would I want to do that? And I was like, well, don't you want to have more friends? He's like, oh, that sounds exhausting. I was like, oh, how many friends do you want to have? He's like four, exactly four. He has four friends at any given time. He rotates in and out of these, these four friends and that's all he wants. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, that was obviously my issue and not yours. It creates a sense of okayness. So he's okay that he's only got four friends. Your clients can be okay that they don't get invited for Thursday night drinks because they've turned it down every single time. Um, Accept of our identity. And again, that is a process, especially with this wave of newly diagnosed people. Every single one of my clients who are diagnosed in about the past five or 10 years have at one point in time or another said to me, I just wish I was normal. I just wish I wasn't autistic. I wasn't dyslexic. I wasn't ADHD. I wasn't, I wasn't. What they're saying is I don't feel okay in myself. But when we look at the life and can help our clients look at the life with this lens of um, kind of social acceptance and identity, identity acceptance, guess what? They start to feel okay. And a lot of these other things kind of dissipate. dissipate. Creates the opp opportunity for empathy, both on both for neurotypical and neurodivergent people. And y'all being able to trust myself, it's a learning process, but it's still there. It's, it's amazing when you're like, actually, I can decide that I don't like mushrooms and that doesn't make me a bad person. So professional and awareness, our, our clients are going to come with lots of baggage, right? All of them do. All of our clients, neurotypical, neurodivergent, the whole spectrum are all going to come to us with their own baggage. Some of the things that you'll see in a lot of your neurodivergent clients will, are on this page. And I'll say it's very personal. So you never really know what, what's going to come through the door with that, just like with your neuro, neurotypical clients. And rejection sensitivity is a big part of it. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. But then there's this idea of compartmentalization. So this is the idea of like, the fact that I had a good day at work does not mean I'm going to have a good day at home because what is those two things don't have anything to do with each other. Or, you know, being able to kind of generalize an emotion, generalize a feeling across several different environments, it doesn't always happen. The other thing that makes a lot of people uncomfortable is um, dealing with grief and trauma. Sometimes people who compartmentalize deal with it actually fairly quickly because they put it in a box and they understand it. Um, and it's very off-putting to some people because they think it means that they don't care. And actually, no, they, they're just okay. Most neurodivergent people will come with educational trauma. Um, a neurodivergent child by the age of 11 will have heard 10,000 more, uh, sorry, no, 20,000 more negative comments than their neurotypical peers. So, of course, we're sensitive to rejection. We get it all the time. And that's by the time you're 11. Imagine by the time you get through the teenage years, right? They might have gaps in their awareness so the understanding of why I don't pick my nose on camera, but my nose was itching and I wanted to, or people are looking at me, you know, I mean, things as, as, you know, kind of brazen as that, but also gaps in understanding how much people think about me and how much my um, process impacts other people. Verbal processing is another one. Please, if you have a neurodivergent client in your pre-coaching questionnaire, ask this question. Do you like to process with words out loud, because there's a lot of misunderstanding that happens between client and, and um, coach, because I, I'm a verbal processor, which means when I start talking about something, I haven't decided until I get to the end of my talking, but they hear the first five seconds of what I'm saying. And they're like, oh, well, let's check in with you here. I just want to pause you there. I want to do this. And it's like, oh, but I'm not there yet. I'm just, I'm just all that stuff that you do in your head. I do out loud. They're also process detectives, so they might be going, actually, why is it that she does this thing? What is she trying to accomplish? They want to know the why of certain interventions, certain things that you might recommend, different tools that you're doing. Just let them know. Let them, you know, we're not being ninjas here. And always watch out for the good student. Did you understand that? Yeah. Was it beneficial? Absolutely. Check in there and be like, was it really... If you have that kind of like, did you really get this? You can say, you know, you don't, I'm, I'm not your mom. I'm not your teacher. You can tell me if this doesn't work for you. Please, it's okay. It's a safe space for that. And it will take time for people who like to be the good student to kind of 
pull that back a bit because it's an it's a learned survival skill. So masking. <laughs> masking. Oh, it's one of those things that it's it gets thrown out all the time on TikToks and it just makes me angry because people use it wrong. But I've never heard it better described than this. And a client said, I'm always trying to be normal. I'm always trying to pass. And it's exhausting. <laughs> It is not the same thing as choosing my emotions. Masking is a strategy that kind of involves concealing or suppressing my neurodivergent traits to appear neurotypical, right? I want you to think I'm normal because I've been called weird my whole life. And when I say normal, you know, what does that mean, right? But, uh, but in my head, I know that I'm not that and I'm trying to be. So um, it could be Facial expressions. One of the things that I've learned that I have to communicate to people is the fact that I'm smiling does not mean that I'm okay or that I'm happy. I have learned to smile as a coping mechanism. Um, so it means nothing really, unless I'm laughing. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm happy. Uh, forcing eye contact. People who... Um, we used to teach um, autistic children to look between people's eyebrows so it would look like they were having eye contact because it was so important. Eye contact, it's don't, you need to look at me when I'm talking to you. So, okay, well, I don't want to be yelled at. So I will very uncomfortably stare into your eyes with this ninja death stare. It's awful, y'all. But that's what we're forcing our kids to do. Um, my speech, my my tone, body movements. Stimming is something that autistic people and some um, ADHD people like to do. It's a movement and it, and it has several different processes, but I hold it in, which actually causes my muscles to, be to have a lot of pain because people don't like it when you rock back and forth or they're constantly going, are you okay? Because they think that you're anxious, but you're not. You're in your happy place. Uh, rehearsing conversations. Um, Hiding your interests. So it's not everybody else is obsessed with musical theater. So I have to pretend like I like, you know, 90s hip hop rap. Okay, I'll do that so that I can have friends. You know, these things that we do to try and pass, to try and appear a certain way. Um, feigning understanding is a big one and hiding sensory overload. Um, we talk about sensory sensitivity quite a bit, um, but people don't quite understand what it means necessarily. It's not the same thing as, you know, I don't like to have bright lights. I mean, I don't, but it's like, so my son wears his socks inside out because the seam on his socks, when he wears them right side out, um, feels like razor blades on his toes. And he would get in trouble for that at school because it's not how we wear our uniform. And I had to go in and, and challenge some ableist um, behavior from teachers. Um, identity confusion, burnout is a huge one. Burnout is huge in neurodivergent clients for a lot of different reasons. But there's a lot of internalized shame because we're constantly being told that we're wrong and that we should be ashamed of ourselves. So I have a masking exercise for us to do. So what I want you to do is make your face say, I am so happy to be here. I want you to be really, really happy. So everybody together, just kind of big, oh, how does, and then out loud, I want you to say, it's really painful to sit in this chair. It doesn't, it's really painful to sit in this chair. Those two things don't go together, but you're masking, you're smiling and you're masking that you're happy to be here, but your mouth is not saying the same thing that your body is saying. Okay, have your face say, oh, I'm so tired, I'm so tired. And then with this face, but say, I can't wait to join the team sports day. I'm so excited. Uh, it's going to be great. There's a real disconnect there. Have your face say, I'm terrified. I'm absolutely terrified. I'm ready to have my review and I look forward to the feedback. There's that constant disconnect of trying to look one way and be another and feeling that sense of inauthenticity. And it is palpable. It is uncomfortable and oftentimes painful. So emotional regulation, this is a huge, huge word and often a weapon word used against people who are neurodivergent. But it, basically what it means is I have an awareness of my emotions. Uh, I can manage my emotional response. I can manage my emotional expression and I can use effective coping strategies. Now, all of that sounds great, except what if my natural emotional response is different than what is considered okay in this world? What if my natural way of coping with an emotion is to stim and rock back and forth, but I'm not allowed to do that? 
and I'm not allowed to use my coping strategies. Well, that creates emotional dysregulation. And there are many different ways that it shows up because um, in communication, there are two parts. And I say this to all of my relationship clients, lots of people, there's what is being given and there's what is being received. And if I don't know necessarily, or I don't behave in a way that you can receive what I'm giving you, or you behave in a way that feels strange to me or alien to me that I can't receive what you're saying, then there's the disconnect in communication. So one of the big ways this shows up is in rejection sensitivity. So rejection sensitivity dysphoria is, um, it causes people to experience emotional pain when they feel rejected or when they feel that they have failed. Now, this is about how they feel, not about reality. I'll give you an example that actually happened to me today. So I was um, on the call with Claire Dale. And before we, um, we you know, launched it for everybody, we had like a kind of a one-on-one. -on -one and, um, you know, and, and I think Joe was there or Zoe, no, Joe was there. And I said, oh, it's nice to meet you. Now, in my head, I know that I've met Claire before. I know, her, like we met last week, right? What I meant, I meant to say probably something like, oh, it's nice to see you and it's good to be in this meeting space, but it came out, it's nice to meet you. And we moved on for the next 10 minutes. Part of my brain was going, now, how are you going to let her know that, you, that you've met her before? And is she feeling really embarrassed? Does she think she's not memorable? Because she is memorable and I'm really excited to talk to her and her work is important. What if she thinks I don't think her work is important? And I'm doing all these other things. And luckily I'm ADHD, so I can have about five things going on in my brain at once. But I was literally spinning out over the fact that I said, it's nice to meet you when I'd already met her. She, she may not have even noticed. I don't know. But I feel like I failed in that situation. I feel like I caused a rejection. And it's a dysphoria. It's a feeling of embarrassment. It's difficulty in managing reactions. And it's, it's most oftentimes, um, just by its nature, inaccurate. So let's think about some of the things that we say as coaches that could trigger this in somebody. So here are some areas for improvement. Okay? Pretty standard thing that we say you failed, you're not good enough. That is how I would receive that if it's not handled properly. Okay. I didn't see your text um, until just now. Sorry for the late response. Yeah. But what she's really saying is I was ignoring you because I don't like you because you're really annoying. What was said was, I'm sorry, I have to cancel our, uh, our session this week. What I hear is I don't want to spend time with you and you don't matter to me. So we have to be mindful when, when we know, and again, we don't always know, but when we do, we need to be mindful of how we handle these things. So instead of saying, here are some areas of improvement, I can say, how do it, would it feel to know you could be even better, right? Because that's let me know, oh, better, hmm, okay. I didn't see your texts. Um, instead of saying, uh, ooh, sorry, y'all, that that didn't save. Instead of saying, sorry, I didn't see your text until just now. Sorry for, for the late response. I can say, I know that you like a fast response for texting. I'm really, really sorry. I don't think that you're annoying. I literally just saw that. Um, here's my response. Sorry for the typo, y'all. Uh, that's going to trigger some RSD, right? <laughs> I'm sorry. I have to cancel our session next week. I'm going to say, I'm so sorry. I have to move our session. Uh, can we get something in the diary right now? Thanks so much for understanding. Right. So that lets me know that's letting the other person know you matter to me. This is important. It's out of my control or out of it's it's an important thing for me to change it, but I'm gonna make sure that we have our time. So coaching considerations, what do we need to think about? Are the words that you're using clear, concise, and accessible? Are you putting too much flowery language into things where I have to try and figure out what you mean? Are you checking for accessibility and for my accessibility, not for yours? Have you, um, how have you con uh, contracted to check for authentic emotional expression and reaction? So have you contracted to say, hey, am I allowed to interrupt you if I feel like you're spinning out? Am I allowed to, would you like me to interrupt you if um, you're going into story too much and I need to pull you back? Can you tell me what it's like when you're feeling overwhelmed when you're feeling too much because a lot of the times I can't see it on your face and we're on an expression can we have a code a hand signal or something if you're feeling overwhelmed the next question I'd ask you is have you done the work to manage your unconscious bias around neurodiversity and neurodivergence and around how coaches should do coaching 
Um, an example of this, I had a client who was a verbal dyspraxic. And so basically what that means is he would use very small words. He had a very strong stutter and didn't like to talk because he had a hard time. There was a disconnect between his brain and his mouth, basically. But when he wrote, it was eloquent and it was beautiful. And he had a deep, deep understanding of the world. So he would sit across the room from me and text me. And I would answer him out loud because his receptive communication was fine. So am I making sure I'm doing coaching your way and not my way? And are you informed enough to manage and hold a coaching space in a neuro-inclusive way? If you're not, there, there's ways to do it and there's ways to learn. But if you're not, just be mindful of that. Be, you know, check in. You know, a whole part of being a coach is knowing what my professional development should look like. So I'm going to sum this up with a word from Drake. Drake is my oldest. Um, and I asked him one time, how would you describe to people what it's like to be autistic? And he's like, well, it's like if you took me, a white British American teenager, and you put me in the middle of 1850s Japan. In the beginning, I'm going to freak out. I'm going to struggle. I'm not going to understand them. They're not going to understand me. But with enough kindness and compassion and with enough understanding, I can learn the language. I can understand how to eat. I can understand how to dress. I can understand how to kind of be in that world. But I'm always going to look different and I'm always going to have an accent. So if we can allow spaces for the neural divergent people in our lives just to look a little bit different, just to have a bit of an accent in this neurotypical world, then we can create a neural inclusive space for them. The last thing I'm going to tell you is our big reveal. And I'm so excited about this. Like, I like this is not pretending. I'm so excited. In Good Company is, is um, announcing Neurodivergent Affirmative Practitioner Program. There's a QR code right there so that you can join the wait list. Um, this is a new program that I am developing at the moment. It's it, We're getting there. It's almost done. It's, it is going to be open for sale on Black Friday. It is going to start in January, and you are the first ones get, to get the official notice on this. Um, in this training, you are going to learn how to create and hold those spaces for neurodivergent clients um, and practice in a way that helps them be affirmative in their own neurodivergence and for you to, um, to create that space for them. So I know I've done a lot of talking, but I do want to open it up to any questions that you might have. So I'm going to keep that slide there in case you want to join the wait list and see, are there any questions? Oh, Gwen, um, I think people are interested, but they're saying it says page not found. Um, yeah. on oh, you know what, y'all? Take a picture of it. I think I, <laughs> I think I forgot to have it go from draft to active. To published, yeah. So, yeah. so it's coming. <laughs> <I'm working laughs> Don't worry. Um, we will share the information with you in the emails after this as well. Uh, Gwen, are you actually going in to publish it now, or do you want me to do that? <laughs> oh, we'll do it after this is this is done. I want to have questions. So, and if anyone has any questions, I want to hold space for that. Yeah. But I will publish it today. <laughs> There have been lots of comments um, through the chat, people relating to the things that you've been sharing. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce the name right, Shadi. Sorry, I was mute. Uh, I was on mute. Um, <laughs> yes, Shadi, that, that is correct. Um, question about the, the program that you're ro rolling out. Um, suitable or what are your thoughts on somebody who's already had some training on I'm a neurodiversity coach. I'm an ADHD coach. Is this a program that um, that would be helpful for me as well? You know, first I'll say, um, before I get going on this, send, send me an email at cpd at igcompany.co.uk and we'll, I, I'm happy to hop on a call with you and see if it's right for you specifically. Um, a lot of ADH, ADHD coach training um depending on which one you've been on, um, offers a lot of support around ADHD, but not enough depth, in my opinion, on co-occurring conditions. And so just like with any program, there are going to be levels to this. So you can take your learning as deep as you want, and it can be, um, there's going to be areas to stretch you. Um, is it going to offer you um, some of the same information that you already know? Probably. Um, but maybe it'll be a different slant on it. And like I said, we can do a one-to-one -one call on that to see. But I would encourage um, I would encourage you to look at the page and say, what is it in my ADHD training that I feel like I could have um, 
kind of a re-up on. Also, remember that if you're ICF, for example, qualified, you have to have 40 CCEs by the end of three years. And so this is going to help you meet those requirements. There's always different ways when you work in this world to find a different perspective, to find a different way of learning and a different way of understanding um, so that you can go forward and deepen your learning, enrich your learning, and enrich in your Oh, I can't you find the word. Get deeper learning and do it better is what I'm trying to say in a really fancy way. So um, so that's what I would say on that. But please do send me an email and we'll get on a call and see. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions for Gwen? Um, I can see one saying, where, how, where can they find you, Gwen? Well, uh, LinkedIn is the space where I like to be. So you can find me at Gwen Jones DEI on LinkedIn. Um, Gwen.jones at uh, igcompany.co.uk or, CPD, or cpd at igcompany.co.uk. All of those come to me. So any questions that you might have, any private conversations you might want to have. I'm also in the coaching crowd and in the coaching business crowd business lounge within good company. So you can find me in those spaces as well. If you're not in that space I, and you're a coach, I highly encourage you to go into both of those Facebook spaces um, because there's some really deep learning on all levels of coaching. But that's where I hang out. Could you repeat uh, those hangout places? Sorry? Could you repeat the... Oh, um... Yeah. So um, Gwen Jones DEI is my LinkedIn. Um, in Facebook, we have uh, the Coaching Crowd and the Coaching Crowd Business Lounge. So I'll be in both of those Facebook um, communities. And then if you need to send me a private email, it's gwen.jones at igcompany.co.uk or cpd at I, um, igcompany.co.uk. The coaching crowd group is a free group that you can access if you're a coach or you're interested in coaching. It's a really supportive space. The coaching crowd business lounge is a is part of our paid uh, coaching crowd business lounge and we open that up roughly every six months. We'll probably be next opening it um, at Christmas time. Got a great question here, Gwen, which is, um, I'm a neurodivergent coach and I have um, uh, all day each, sorry, um, ADHD and are autistic and dyslexia. A big part of the struggles you talked about affect my coaching style. And in some cases, I find it difficult to meet the needs of my ND clients. Do you have ideas for contracting or check-ins that can help communicate my needs in the coaching? Or should I, as the coach, be sucking it up? Oh, never. Suck. We need to model first, right? So I don't want to model to my clients that they need to suck it up, especially in a neurodivergent space, and especially someone who's neurodivergent. What I might do is say, I could ask a question that is completely wrong. Please tell me, do you, how would you like to tell me if I'm getting it wrong? I'm okay with that. I would love that feedback. How would you like to tell me if, if you feel like um, I'm going down the right path or the wrong path? How would you like me to show up for you? Um, you, you know, I, you know, I always self um, disclose because honestly, if you look me up on LinkedIn, it's neurodiversity is everywhere anyway. So I'll say, you know, I'm ADHD, I'm autistic. And um, oftentimes you might see me stim. So the way I have a tendency to stim in, um, in a session is I have these bracelets, you know, these little things like that, and I'll move them back and forth. I was like, please don't take that as me being bored. I want you to understand that that's something that I do naturally, and it's a way that I can do it. So it's not going to be intrusive for you. Um, so whatever the issue is that you feel is getting in your way, find a way to frame it for the coach coachee to say, in service of your coaching, I'm disclosing this how can I support you to make sure that this um, doesn't get in your way? Does that make sense? And then, of course, you know, getting your own coaching as well. We we all need our own. Y'all, I just started it in good company. I have a brand new coach coming with me because it is a new space. I need to have that support for me, despite the fact that I've worked in this for 25 years, because I am still learning about myself and my neurodiversity and how it shows up and when it's obnoxious for me and when it's obnoxious for others and when I don't understand, I need a, a coaching space to work through that because I'm growing and changing as a person and my neurodiversity, my neurodivergence grows and changes with me. Thank you. And Erica, you have you got a question? Thank you. Um, can I seek forgiveness before I ask? Because I don't want to offend anybody here. This is a um, learning space, Erica. Okay. I'm proud of you for being brave. I just, I just wonder whether there's any 
any medical sort of science and research that suggests this might be evolution and and because there are so this it's becoming so much more uh, people are becoming so much more aware of the differences that people can have you know um and i just wonder whether the more and more we hear about these things you know is there is there a normal or actually is it just a you know not just but is it about recognizing the differences in every single human being and that's that's exhausting in itself really trying to think about how can I make sure that I encounter for you know or, or cover for everybody in every single situation but it, it could it be that it's actually that as a human race we are evolving and our brains are evolving in such a way and people who have um these um traits the this behavior that you know I don't I don't mean to to generalize people at all but perhaps it's just that the the better <laughs> quicker <laughs> and moving along a bit faster than, than me <laughs> as an example I hear what you're saying Erica mm-hmm. and I'm going to say yes that I am just much more highly evolved <laughs> than everyone else and that is what no <laughs> um, so, so there are lots of theories on mm-hmm. that so um Sasha Baron Cohen's brother whose first name I can Simon Baron Cohen um has done a lot of work that we don't like anymore in autism, for example, but he has put a book out recently called The Change Makers that's all about the evolution of neural divergence. The way I like to put it is if you think about gazelles on the Serengeti and when they start to run, they don't run because they see a lion. They run because there's some neurodivergent gazelle in the herd that's like something's about to happen and it starts running and they all go, oh, If they're running, I'm running, because if I don't run, then I'm going to get eaten by a lion. And so they all run together. So in the animal kingdom, we also have neural divergence. It's just they don't care. They just they see they see the value in it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, As humans, sometimes people is it the next stage of evolution. Is it not? I mean, neural diversity has always been around, but it was like your weird uncle or it was the baby that got left in the snow. Or it was the person who um, uh, there was a huge um, issue in like the 80s and 90s in um, America where all of these children with Down syndrome were being accidentally hit by cars in the driveway um, because people didn't value their existence. I mean, it was an accident, right? But the statistical anomaly was huge. And so what do we think has been happening to all all the neurodivergent people over history? We've been shuffling them away, hiding them, being ashamed of them, sometimes murdering them putting them out on the fringes of society because we don't understand them, mocking them. So it's more like we have this evolution of awareness and acceptance, but neurodivergent people have always been here. As mm-hmm. far as does, does the human race evolve to be an ADHD world? I'd love that. Y'all would freak out, but I'd love it, you know? So who knows? But um, if we spend too much time worrying about things like the cause or evolution, or these bigger questions, which are fascinating um, and fun to read into, we need to make sure that we're holding double, triple the space for just accepting the person that's in front of us. And I think that's my question, really, which is around how how can we be as as inclusive as we possibly can be as coaches and as human beings of everyone? I mean, that's the big question, right? And I've got an easy answer that doesn't have an easy solution is just do the work. Yeah got to do the work we had the same question on racial uh, identity earlier how do i do that well you do the work there's no easy way through but it's a really easy answer mm-hmm. thank you it's been really really fascinating absolutely thank you so much gwen um it's resonated so much with so many people he- here and this is important for us as coaches um, we are working with clients who identify as neurodivergent whether they're diagnosed or not and you know, if a client is disclosing something to you and you're then going into panic because you think, oh, I don't know what I need to do. I don't want to do anything wrong. I want to help and support. What we want to do is help to equip you to build your confidence, to build your understanding so that you can continue to be a great coach for all of your clients. So, um, and Gwen, it's a delight to have you on our team and you bring so much value uh, to our team. And we're looking forward to you know, learning from you, with you, and creating some amazing stuff. So if you are interested, check out the wait page and you'll have all of the information as we release it. And <laughs> you 